In the outskirts of Bethlehem, amid the arid desert, a tragic event was unfolding. Rachel, the beloved wife of Jacob, was fighting for her life during the birth of her second child. The scorching sun seemed to bear silent witness as Rachel, in agony, struggled to bring her child into the world. Her cries of pain echoed through the tents of Jacob's caravan, while he, helpless, watched his wife's battle. Hope dwindled with each breath until finally, the weak cry of a newborn filled the air. Yet, along with the joy of birth came the tragedy of farewell. Exhausted and weakened, Rachel departed from this world, leaving Jacob engulfed in the sorrow of loss. Thus, Benjamin was born, wrapped in tears and longing, forever marked by his mother's last breath. But what truly happened to Rachel? Does the Bible explain the real reason for her death? This is what we will uncover in today's video. As usual, I kindly ask you to subscribe to the channel and click the like button. Now, let's get into the video. Rachel, one of the Bible's most captivating figures, has her story uniquely intertwined with Jacob, her future husband. Their encounter is detailed in the book of Genesis and is a love story that transcends time. Jacob, fleeing from the wrath of his brother Esau, left his homeland in Canaan and traveled to the land of Aram, where his uncle Laban lived. His journey was long and exhausting, but he carried the hope of finding refuge and a new life. Upon arriving in the region of Paddan Aram, Jacob came upon a well where shepherds gathered to water their flocks. It was there that he first saw Rachel. Rachel was a shepherdess, tending her father Laban's sheep. Upon seeing her, Jacob was instantly captivated by her beauty and grace. He approached and, in a great display of strength, removed the stone covering the well, allowing Rachel's sheep to drink. This act of kindness and physical prowess impressed Rachel, and their encounter quickly became memorable. Jacob introduced himself to Rachel as the son of Rebekah, Laban's sister, and was warmly received. Rachel ran home to tell her father about Jacob's arrival. Upon hearing of his nephew's presence, Laban hurried to meet Jacob and welcomed him into his home. Already in love with Rachel, Jacob decided he wanted to marry her. He proposed a deal to Laban, he would work for seven years as a shepherd in exchange for Rachel's hand in marriage. Laban agreed, and Jacob began to work with dedication and love, counting the days until he could marry his beloved. The seven years passed quickly for Jacob, such was his passion for Rachel. He said to Laban, Give me my wife, for my time is completed, so that I may marry her. Genesis 29 verse 21 Laban then prepared a great feast and invited all the men of the place for the wedding celebration. However, Laban had other plans. On the wedding night, he deceived Jacob by substituting his elder daughter, Leah, veiled and hidden by the darkness of night. Jacob did not realize the deception until the next morning when he discovered he had married Leah instead of Rachel. Furious, Jacob confronted Laban. Laban explained that in their land, it was customary to marry off the elder daughter first. Nonetheless, he offered a solution, Jacob could also marry Rachel, provided he agreed to work another seven years. Though disappointed, Jacob's love for Rachel was so great that he accepted the deal. He completed the week of celebration with Leah before marrying Rachel. Another seven years passed, and Jacob finally married Rachel, thus ending up with both women. Jacob's family life with his two wives, Rachel and Leah, was marked by intense rivalry. Although Jacob deeply loved Rachel, it was Leah who initially bore him children. Leah gave birth to four sons, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah. With each birth, she hoped to win Jacob's love, but he continued to prefer Rachel. Rachel, on the other hand, suffered deeply from her barrenness. She envied Leah's fertility and despaired over her inability to bear children for Jacob. In a moment of deep despair, Rachel turned to Jacob and said, Give me children, or else I die. This poignant plea is recorded in Genesis, chapter 30, verse 1. Jacob, equally distressed, 
responded with frustration, reminding her that it was God who controlled fertility and that he was powerless in this matter. Determined to compete with her sister Leah, Rachel turned to an ancient custom. She gave her maidservant Bilhah to Jacob as a concubine, hoping that Bilhah would bear children on her behalf. Bilhah bore two sons, Dan and Naphtali, thereby giving Rachel a semblance of victory in her sibling rivalry. Not to be outdone, Leah also gave her maidservant Zilpah to Jacob, and Zilpah bore him two more sons, Gad and Asher. Rachel, however, remained undeterred in her quest to conceive. She explored various methods believed in popular lore to aid fertility, one of which was the use of mandrakes. In antiquity, mandrakes were considered a powerful remedy, believed to possess aphrodisiac properties that could help barren women conceive. One day, Reuben, Leah's eldest son, found mandrakes in the field and brought them to his mother. Upon seeing the plants, Rachel pleaded with Leah to give her some, hoping they would help her conceive. Leah, aware of Rachel's desperate longing, agreed to trade the mandrakes for a night with Jacob, which would normally be Rachel's. Despite Rachel's hopes, the mandrakes did not bring immediate success. Her frustration grew, yet she remained relentless in her pursuit of motherhood. Time passed, and Rachel continued to pray fervently to God, beseeching him for the blessing of children. Finally, in Genesis 30, verse 22, it is written, Then God remembered Rachel, he listened to her and enabled her to conceive. Rachel bore a son and named him Joseph, declaring, God has taken away my disgrace. The name Joseph, meaning may he add, reflected her hope that God would bless her with more children. The birth of Joseph brought immense joy and relief to Rachel. It not only fulfilled her longing for a child but also elevated her status within the family, earning her a newfound position of honor and respect. Joseph would go on to become a central figure in the history of Israel, his extraordinary destiny leading him to become the governor of Egypt and saving his family during a time of famine. This significant role underscored the importance of Rachel in the biblical narrative. Years after Joseph's birth, Rachel's hope for a second child was fulfilled. She became pregnant again, a blessing that filled the family with great joy and anticipation. By this time, Jacob had left the land of Laban and was returning to his homeland of Canaan, following God's command. As they journeyed, Rachel's pregnancy advanced. She was acutely aware of the risks, given the challenges she faced in conceiving Joseph. Nonetheless, the joy of carrying another child overshadowed her fears. This second child was the realization of her hope expressed in Joseph's name, that God would continue to add to her blessings. As Jacob's caravan approached Ephrath, later known as Bethlehem, Rachel went into labor. The conditions of the time were harsh, lacking the medical assistance available in modern times for complicated births. Rachel's labor pains were intense, and complications soon became apparent. Genesis 35, verses 16 to 17 recounts this harrowing moment. They moved on from Bethel, and while they were still some distance from Ephrath, Rachel began to give birth and had great difficulty. And as she was having great difficulty in childbirth, the midwife said to her, Don't be afraid, for you have another son. Despite the midwife's attempt to comfort her, the birth was fraught with peril. Rachel endured immense suffering, but in the midst of her pain, she gave birth to a son. As her life ebbed away, she named him Benoni, meaning son of my sorrow. However, Jacob, seeking to honor his beloved Rachel and perhaps to lessen the burden of grief associated with the name, renamed him Benjamin, meaning son of my right hand. Rachel's passing was a moment of profound sorrow for Jacob and the entire family. Her death marked the end of an era, but her legacy lived on through her sons, Joseph and Benjamin. Joseph's future accomplishments and Benjamin's significance in the tribes of Israel would forever bear testament to Rachel's enduring influence. Jacob buried Rachel on the way to Ephrath, setting up a pillar over her tomb. This pillar, known as Rachel's tomb, remains a site of reverence and memory. Rachel's story, a blend of deep sorrow and profound joy, 
encapsulates the trials and triumphs of faith, the complexities of family dynamics, and the relentless pursuit of one's deepest desires. Her life and legacy are woven into the fabric of biblical history, her narrative a powerful reminder of the enduring human spirit and the timeless quest for fulfillment and legacy. It was a difficult time, and as it happened, while she labored in childbirth, the midwife, seeing Rachel's distress, reassured her, Do not be afraid, for you will have this son also. The midwife's words offered a flicker of comfort to Rachel amidst her excruciating pain. She knew her life hung by a thread, but she clung to the hope and promise of seeing her second child born. Rachel's agony was profound, reflecting the severity of the complications she faced. When she finally gave birth, Rachel was utterly exhausted, teetering on the brink of death. With her last reserves of strength, she named her newborn son Benoni, meaning son of my sorrow or son of my pain. This name encapsulated the deep sadness and suffering Rachel had endured during childbirth. The birth of Benoni was a moment of profound ambivalence, an intense mixture of the joy of new life and the imminent sorrow of losing his mother. Jacob, deeply shaken by Rachel's death, made a significant decision regarding their son's name. He chose to rename Benoni to Benjamin, which means son of the right hand or son of happiness. This name change held great importance for several reasons. Firstly, it served as a tribute to the deep love Jacob had for Rachel, transforming the negative connotations associated with Benoni's birth into something positive. Secondly, the name Benjamin symbolized the honor and special status he would hold within the family, being the last child of Jacob and Rachel. Genesis 35 verse 18 records this poignant moment, and it came to pass, as her soul was departing, for she died, that she called his name Benoni, but his father called him Benjamin. Benjamin, Rachel's second son, would become the progenitor of one of the twelve tribes of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin. This tribe played a crucial role in the formation and development of the Israelite nation. One of the most notable descendants of Benjamin was Saul, the first king of Israel. Saul's selection as king marked a pivotal turning point in Israelite history, transitioning from a tribal confederation led by judges to a centralized monarchy. Another prominent figure descending from the tribe of Benjamin was the Apostle Paul, also known as Saul of Tarsus. In his epistles, Paul identifies himself as an Israelite from the tribe of Benjamin, stating, I say then, hath God cast away his people? God forbid! For I also am an Israelite, of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. Romans 11 verse 1 However, Rachel's death was a devastating blow to Jacob and his family. Profoundly grieved, Jacob buried Rachel on the way to Ephrath, which is Bethlehem. He erected a pillar on her grave, a testament to his everlasting love and the enduring memory of Rachel. Genesis 35 verses 19 to 20 states, And Rachel died, and was buried in the way to Ephrath, which is Bethlehem. And Jacob set a pillar upon her grave, that is the pillar of Rachel's grave unto this day. The marker on Rachel's grave remained a symbol of her life and Jacob's love, even through subsequent generations. The memory of Rachel and her role in shaping the people of Israel was honored. The circumstances surrounding Rachel's death remain shrouded in mystery. Some scholars and theologians suggest her death might be linked to specific events and declarations during her life. Three primary theories arise from scriptures and traditions to explain what happened. One of the most common interpretations is that Rachel might have been cursed by Jacob, leading to her premature death. This theory is based on a particular incident involving Laban's household idols. When Jacob decided to flee from Laban's house, Rachel stole her father's idols and hid them. Laban, upon discovering the idols were missing, pursued Jacob and his family. When Laban confronted Jacob about the stolen idols, Jacob, unaware that Rachel was the culprit, proclaimed a curse, with whomsoever thou findest thy gods, let him not live. Genesis 31 verse 32 Unbeknownst to Jacob, 
Rachel had hidden the idols in her belongings and sat on them, feigning inability to stand up due to her condition. Thus, Laban did not find the idols, and Rachel's deed remained concealed. Nevertheless, the weight of Jacob's unknowing curse might have contributed to the tragic outcome. Another interpretation links Rachel's death to her earlier struggles with barrenness and the intense desire for children. Rachel had implored Jacob to give her children or else she would die. Her passionate plea, give me children, or else I die, Genesis 30 verse 1, is seen by some as a foreboding declaration that came true. The narrative surrounding Rachel's death is one rich with layers of interpretation, raising numerous theological and moral questions. One prevalent interpretation is that Jacob's declaration, which some view as a curse, inadvertently came to fruition with Rachel's untimely death. Although the Bible does not provide an explicit connection between Jacob's words and Rachel's demise, this interpretation suggests that his words held a mystical or prophetic power, leading to tragic consequences. According to this view, Jacob's utterance, made in a moment of ignorance or emotional intensity, unleashed a fatal power that ultimately sealed Rachel's fate. This interpretation is widely debated, primarily because it hinges on the belief that words spoken without full awareness can still manifest significant and often unintended outcomes. Another aspect of Rachel's story that fuels various interpretations is the incident involving Laban's idols. Rachel's act of stealing her father's idols raises profound questions about her morality and religious devotion. By taking the idols, Rachel was engaging in an act that directly contradicted the monotheistic devotion to God. Some scholars interpret this action as evidence of Rachel's underlying idolatrous tendencies, which were at odds with her husband's faith. From this perspective, Rachel's death during the childbirth of her second son, Benjamin, can be seen as a form of divine punishment. This view posits that Rachel's moral transgression, stealing and keeping her father's pagan idols, warranted a severe response from God, who often punished idolatry harshly in the biblical narrative. Thus, Rachel's death is seen as a direct result of her sin, serving as a divine retribution. However, it is crucial to note that the Bible does not explicitly link Rachel's act of stealing the idols with her death. This connection remains speculative and is subject to theological analysis and interpretation. The lack of a direct biblical assertion leaves room for diverse interpretations and debates among scholars and theologians. Another intriguing theory revolves around a poignant statement Rachel made earlier in her life, during a period of deep despair over her barrenness. In Genesis 30 verse 1, Rachel, desperate to have children, exclaimed to Jacob, Give me children, or I shall die. At the time, this statement was likely a hyperbolic expression of her anguish and intense longing to become a mother. Yet, some interpreters see these words as prophetic or self-fulfilling. They argue that Rachel, in her moment of intense emotional turmoil, inadvertently pronounced her destiny. According to this view, Rachel's death during the birth of her second son, Benjamin, represents a tragic and literal fulfillment of her desperate declaration. This interpretation relies on the belief in the performative power of words, particularly those spoken in moments of heightened emotion, suggesting that Rachel's fate was sealed by her own utterance. The concept that words, especially those spoken with deep emotional intensity, can shape one's destiny is a recurring theme in various cultural and religious contexts. It underscores the human vulnerability in the mysterious interplay between fate and free will in biblical narratives. While none of these theories have a conclusive basis in scripture, they reflect the complexities of biblical interpretation and human attempts to understand tragic events through theological and moral lenses. Rachel's story is rich in symbolism and meaning, making her death a focal point for reflection and analysis. Her life and untimely death are not merely historical events but also carry profound spiritual and moral lessons that continue to resonate with and inspire faith and contemplation. Rachel, as the beloved wife of Jacob, faced numerous challenges, including rivalry with her sister Leah and the prolonged struggle against barrenness. 
Despite these trials, her story exemplifies perseverance, faith, and divine grace. Rachel's narrative illustrates the complex relationship between humanity and God, where personal trials and deep desires intersect with the divine plan. Through her perseverance and unwavering faith, Rachel's life underscores the themes of divine sovereignty and the power of sincere, heartfelt supplication. Despite the hardships she endured, Rachel's legacy through her children and descendants left a lasting impact on the history of Israel. Her story continues to inspire generations with its depiction of faith, resilience, and devotion in the face of adversity. Rachel's life, marked by personal suffering and the quest for divine blessings, personifies the universal human struggle for meaning, faith, and fulfillment. As we reflect on Rachel's life and death, it is essential to recognize that these interpretations and theories, while thought-provoking, are speculative and open to theological debate. The Bible does not provide explicit explanations for many of the events and statements surrounding Rachel's story, leaving much to human interpretation and reflection. More important than identifying the precise cause of Rachel's death is understanding the broader lessons and meanings that her story conveys. The narrative of Rachel invites us to ponder the mysteries of fate, the power of words, and the profound relationship between human actions and divine will. In conclusion, Rachel's story, with its rich symbolism and profound lessons, continues to be a source of inspiration and reflection. Her life and death offer valuable insights into the nature of faith, the complexities of human emotion, and the mysteries of divine providence. Whether one views her death as a result of Jacob's inadvertent curse, divine punishment for idolatry, or a self-fulfilling prophecy, Rachel's story remains a testament to the enduring power of faith and the human spirit. Now, I invite you to share your thoughts. Do you believe in any of these theories? Or do you think all of this was part of the divine plan? Your insights and opinions are valuable in this ongoing exploration of Rachel's story. If you've stayed with us this far, please consider subscribing to our channel, liking this video, and activating the notification bell so you don't miss any of our content. Thank you for watching. Hugs and stay with God.